Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, good night, good whatever time it is where you are. Welcome to today's Math Minute. I don't know what today is. And we're doing things a little differently today. Normally I'm in this corner down here, but I'm not because I'm sick and my sickness has disfigured my visage. Uh, and also I don't have my green screen with me. And so uh, for today, we're just gonna keep it pure. Just the math. You know what I look like. Just imagine what I look like. I don't think I'm gonna keep any of that. I did a video on exponentiation, I don't know, a month ago, a couple months ago. And I wanted to follow up on that video in order to talk more about what we call the power rules, which sometimes we summarize MADSPM. MADSPM stands for multiplication, addition, division, subtraction, parentheses, or power to a power. So there's some number here, some number here. And then once again, the M stands for multiply. The basic idea behind this acronym is this summarizes our power rules, the rules for what we do with powered expressions or exponential expressions. For example, when we say that you see multiplication, you add. What we mean is that if you have an exponential expression or you have a common base, like two to the third times two to the fifth, this particular power rule tells you that the way you evaluate this expression is you actually add those powers. You say, oh, this is the same thing as 2 to the 3 plus 5 power. So in some sense, the power rule is telling us there's this connection between multiplication and addition. For some reason, the multiplication of these two exponential expressions results in what looks like an addition statement, 2 to the 3 plus 5. Now, of course, we know it's not really an addition statement because 2 to the 3 means something like a 2 multiplied by itself three times. And two to the fifth means something like a two multiplied by itself five times. And so of course at the end of that process, we will have a total of eight twos being multiplied together. And so that summative result comes from counting up the number of twos that we're multiplying, but we are still fundamentally multiplying those numbers out. And that's why that particular rule works. Spoiler alert, I can do exactly the same thing with division and subtraction. If I wanted to take something like two to the seventh and divide it by two to the fourth, one way to represent that would be those seven twos, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, divided by another four twos, one, two, three, four. And obviously what happens in that case is four of these, top and bottom, cancel out, and it leaves me with the result two to the third. And so in fact, another way to express this would be as two to the seven minus four power. And again, the connection we're interested in here is the one that takes a division statement and produces something that looks like subtraction. Finally, if we're raising a power to a power, what we mean is that we're taking something like, say, three three squared and raising that to the fourth power. Well, raising something to the fourth power here on the outside means that we're going to take that quantity and multiply it by itself four times. The quantity itself, though, happens to be three squared. And of course, we already said that as we multiply, we're supposed to add up those powers. So three squared times three squared times three squared times three squared ends up being the same thing as three to the two plus two plus two plus two power. But of course, two plus two plus Plus two plus two plus two. That may have been one too many plus twos. I don't remember. That many twos all added together just ends up being the same thing as two times four. And so it's the product of those two powers that ends up giving us our final exponential expression, three to the eight. So when we see a power raised to a power, that's when we actually do go ahead and multiply out those powers. So those are the rules themselves. And if you understand that, you can pretty much evaluate any expressions you need as long as you have that common base, right? This only only works when the base itself that we're using is the same. You could not use this rule with something like 3 squared times 5 to the third power, because in that case, your bases would be different. But as long as the bases are the same like this, we can use this MADSPM idea to remember our power rules. But what I want to talk about for a second is why these power rules work, and then most importantly, two particular consequences of the power rules. How we evaluate things to the zero power, and what we mean by negative powers. And when I say powers over and over again, I realize uh, I sometimes make a mistake here. When I say power, technically speaking, the whole thing is the power. So two to the fifth is a power of two. The two part is what we call the base. It's the base of this power. The five, I should be referring to as an exponent. But just colloquially speaking, we often refer to this five also as the power. So I'm going to try to say exponent. I should be saying exponent rules here, because really it's the whole thing that's a power. But just so you know, oftentimes I may say power 
when I mean the little number up in the corner here. In any case, the two things we want to explore today are what happens when that exponent is zero, what on earth the power rules tell us to expect for when that exponent is zero, and what on earth happens for when that exponent is negative. So I did this video about a month ago where I defined exponentiation in a kind of peculiar way. I said exponentiation is this operation that upgrades addition into multiplication. And I used function notation to write about this, so I wrote about it this way. Imagine we have some function, f of x, but this function takes a sum as an input, so something like f of a plus b, and it returns a product, f of a times f of b. This is the essence of what exponentiation is. If we put this in terms of something with an actual base, so not just this kind of generic function notation, but instead imagine something like 2 to the a power times 2 to the b power, you can get a sense of how this is working. Of course, our power rule tells us, well, this is the same thing as 2 to the a plus b power. So exponentiation is that connection between the product on the one hand and this sum on the other hand. Let's imagine for the moment that this is actually the only thing we know about exponentiation. Let's say that ma of madspum is the only thing we know, that when you multiply, you actually add your exponents together. What other kind of information could we generate? What other rules could we generate just from knowing this particular connection? Of course, we can say things like, well, 2 to the third times 2 to the fifth is going to be equal to 2 to the 3 plus 5 power that is 2 to the 8th power. But what if we wanted to multiply something like 2 to the 3rd times 2 to the 0th power? Our power rule would tell us, well, this is the same thing as 2 to the 3 plus 0 power. But of course, 3 plus 0 is the same as 3. And so what we're really saying is that 2 to the 3rd times 2 to the 0 is the same as 2 to the 3rd. Well, what on earth number must 2 to the 0 be like if when we multiply it by 2 2 to the third, we just get back 2 to the third. What number do you multiply things by that it always gives you back the thing you were multiplying? Hopefully you're saying to yourself, oh, well, that number must be 1. The only number I could multiply 2 to the third by to get back 2 to the third would be 1 itself. And this is why not just for 2 to the zeroth power, but anything to the zero power. We say that it's equal to one. If we want something to obey this first rule of Madspun, that when you multiply exponential expressions with a common base, you can add those exponents together, then we have to say things to the zero power are one, not zero like we might expect since we think of exponentiation as multiplicative and you multiply something out zero number of times, it feels like that should be zero. But if that were true, then it couldn't be the case that two to the third times two to the zero also obeys the rule that you add those powers together. We know two to the third is not zero. And so if we said two to the third times two to the zero is two to the third, some non-zero number, two to the zero cannot itself be zero. It has to be one. One instead. And so this brings us to our zero power rule. In general, any base to the zero power is one. Now there is one possible exception to this. What if a itself is zero? Then what should we do with this expression? But we're not going to deal with that exception right now. If a is any non-zero base for an exponential expression and we raise something to the zero power, we should get one as a result. So let's use that result now and see if we can figure out what's going on with negative powers. Now that we have an idea of what's going on with things raised to the zero power, what's happening with negative powers? Well, again, go back to something like 2 to the third. Imagine that I wanted to multiply 2 to the third by 2 to the negative third. Now, again, I don't know what negative exponents represent, so I don't really know what quantity 2 to the negative third is. But I do know that my power rule tells me since I'm multiplying these expressions, I should be able to take those exponents and add them together, 3 plus negative 3. But again, I know what 3 plus negative 3 is. It's 0. So this is really the same thing as 2 to the 0. So 2 to the third times 2 to the negative third is equal to 2 to the 0. Now we know what 2 to the third is. It's 8. And we also already know what 2 to the 0 is. It's 1. So what kind of number times 8 is going to give us back 1? In fact, we can state this even more generally. If we have some base, a to the n power, and we multiply it by a to the negative n power, we're always going to get a to the n plus negative n power, or a to the 0. But again, we already know 
what a to the 0 is. We can say that that's 1. What kinds of numbers, what do we call it when we can multiply two numbers and get back 1? Think of some actual examples right now. What are two numbers you can multiply together to get back 1? Hopefully you're thinking of numbers like 5 and 1 fifth, 1 half and 2, 7 over 3, and 3 over 7. 8 and 1 8. All of these numbers, of course, are what we typically call reciprocals. Negative powers represent these multiplicative inverses, or these reciprocals. If 2 to the third is 8, 2 to the negative third must be 1 over 8, because that's the only way to get back that zeroth power on the other side that we know to expect from our rule that says when we multiply, we're supposed to add the exponents together. And being that we've agreed that's equal to 1, if we're multiplying stuff and we're getting back 1, things we are multiplying need to be these multiplicative inverses. They need to be reciprocals. Now that's a symbolic heavy way to talk through the different power rules. So to finish up today, I want to illustrate this with some actual numbers. And this might give you an intuition for why things to the zero power are one and why things with negative exponents are reciprocals. Imagine we know what something like 2 to the third is. We'll stick with our powers of 2. 2 to the third, of course, is equal to 8. How would you figure out what 2 to the fourth is instead? Or for that matter, something like 2 to the fifth. Of course, we could just sit here and say, well, 2 to the fourth means you take a 2 and multiply it out 4 times, 2 times 2 times 2 times 2, and that's 16, which is true. But you might also notice, well, we can just take our previous power of 2 and then go ahead and multiply that by one more 2, and we get a result in that case of 16. So 2 to the fourth is 16. And it's kind of like a shortcut to get 2 to the fourth. In that way, how would you figure out 2 to the fifth? Well, you would just take the previous power of 2. 2 to the fourth is 16. And this time you would double that. 16 times 2 is 32. And so 2 to the fifth is 32. But there's no special reason we always have to do this going forward, letting the exponents get larger and larger. We could just as easily do this process going backwards. If we know 2 to the fifth is 32, then 2 to the fourth has to be half as much or 16. And 2 to the third has to be half as much as that or 8. And then 2 squared has to be half as much of that. What's half of 8? 4. And 2 to the first. We haven't talked much about first powers here. What would 2 to the first be in this scenario? It would be half of 4, which is 2. At each step, as we go back, we are dividing by 2 in this case. Every first power is going to be itself. And so what happens when we take one more step backwards to get 2 to the 0th power? We take the number itself, in this case 2, and then divide by that number, which of course gives us 1. And so here's another way to think about what's happening with the 0th power. We are always taking the number itself, its first power, and then dividing by that number. Well, what happens in general when you take a number and divide it by itself? you get a result of 1. And so this is why things to the 0 power are 1. It doesn't represent multiplying something by itself 0 number of times. That doesn't really make sense. It essentially means that you're taking the number and dividing it by itself. Of course, there's no special reason we have to stop at 2 to the 0. What if we do this one more time and go backwards to 2 to the negative first? Again, we're going to take that result from the previous step, 1, and divide it again by 2. In this case, that's 1 half. What if we do that again? What's 2 to the negative second in that scenario? Well, half of a half would be a fourth right? What if we do that again? What's 2 to the negative third in this scenario? Well, we would take half of a fourth, which is an eighth. And hopefully at this point, you're starting to see a connection. 2 to the positive second was 4, and 2 to the negative second was 1 fourth. 2 to the positive third was 8, and 2 to the negative third is 1 eighth. That's that reciprocal connection we were seeing earlier. Knowing that, can you tell me what 2 to the negative fourth is supposed to be equal to? You could compute it as half of an eighth, just like we were doing a moment ago. But you could also see that if 2 to the positive fourth is 16, then 2 to the negative fourth must be 1 over 16, or more accurately, 1 over 2 to the fourth. That is that reciprocal relationship we see between positive and negative powers. 2 to the negative fifth would be the same thing as 1 over 2 to the positive fifth. Or if we evaluated it, 
1 over 32. And so that is what we're looking for with our negative exponents, our zero exponents, and of course our power rules more generally. I hope that was helpful. Feels a little scattered. Feels like maybe I have COVID brain fog going on. So I may have to revisit this one later and explore it a little bit more with you. But if it was helpful, uh, drop a comment down below, like, subscribe, do all that stuff, and I will catch you all next time.